so uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming to this presentation. I'm going to talk to you about the history of Mexico. This is quite a challenge for me because we are talking about more than 3,000 years of history, three millennia. And I'm going to cover everything in only three hours. <laughs> so first thing we have to understand about Mexico is that in our, our past we have had many civilizations, not only Aztec or Maya. They were not just uh, fighting each other in a small, in a small place. You know, uh, if we take a look at this map, well, this is Mexico, and this green area here is what is called the Mesoamerica, which is here, it means the middle of America. And throughout the ages, we have had many civilizations around here. So if we take a look here on the left, is when we find the Toltec, the Aztec, uh, the, the Tihuacan, the Totonac. And they're here in the center, if we find the Olmec, the Mystic, and the Zapotec. And here on the right is where we find the Maya. But we're going to talk a little bit about some of these cultures. The first one is the Olmec. Uh, about 100 years ago, we didn't know anything about it. But one day, there was a farmer working on his land. He found a rock. He tried to remove this rock. And started digging and digging and digging around, and okay, that's gonna be difficult to remove, right? <laughs> so the archaeologists came here, and at uh, first they thought these were Mayan, but for their analysis, well, it revealed there was a completely and different unknown civilization. Then they realized that, well, they, they called it the Olmec. And uh, they realized that they settled in this area of the Gulf of Mexico, nowadays the states of Tabasco and Veracruz as well. We're gonna hear this name many times throughout this presentation. And uh, this civilization, they went all the way to the Pacific and down to Guatemala and El Salvador. So they were the first major civilization in Mexico and they laid the foundations for following civilizations. And, uh, one of the most important elements and the most important thing that they did was the invention of tortillas. But thanks to them, we can do tacos nowadays. And also they invented the first writing in Mesoamerica and also the Vulgate, which the following civilizations also played. But the most recognizable feature about the Olmec perhaps is these colors of heads. They weighed at between four and 11 Feet, they have found about 17 of these of these heads. They um, weigh between 25 and 55 tons. They are made out of volcanic basalt, and the quarry from uh, this stone was extracted is miles and miles away from where they found these heads. So that still remains a mystery. How did they manage to move these uh, heads? through the jungle, across rivers and mountains, and also why to have the features of a African person. So why did it disappear? Well, it seems like it was climate change. And uh, this is a picture for about 10 years ago from this area of Tabasco. This is where the Olmec used to live. So this area, well, it happens that when it rains a lot, it floods. So perhaps something like this happened to the Olmec, but they couldn't manage the situation, and the civilization, well, just went down. Then we go to the Maya. The first Maya uh, tribes arrived to the Yucatan Peninsula by the year 2000 BC. Nowadays, it's the states of Yucatan, Campeche, Tabasco, Chiapas, but also Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador as well. And then by the year 750 BC, they have built the most important cities. Maybe you recognize some of this. We have, for example, my view there, Chichen Itza, Palenque, Lum, and Tikal in Guatemala. But something I have to say about this is that these are not pyramids. These are temples. And we know this because you can see it here. There's a niche, and here you can see doors in here. So these people used to believe that the gods used to live inside these places and also the religious ceremonies were happening in here. But 
Why were these located on top of this pyramidal structure? Well, just to create the distance between the rest of the people, because this is a sacred place, and also because the closer they are to the sky, the closer to the gods as well. So this, the Maya were very smart. They had developed a hieroglyphic writing, and they had a, a very advanced knowledge about many things, but in particular, medicine and astronomy. And so much that they uh, got to predict eclipses, they calculated uh, planet trajectories, and they also created uh, accurate calendars. And they managed to do all of this because also they invented number zero and incorporated it into their calculations. And why did they disappear? Well, it was climate change one more time. And we know this, that uh, in the ninth century, uh, for about 50 years, there was not enough rain. Just imagine all this big cities, most of the time they were overpopulated. Of course, you have to feed all these people. So if you have rain, you cannot grow plants, so no food. So these cities, uh, before they were trading with each other, so now they were fighting over the resources, and due to this, why the, the people uh, needed to escape to the jungle and those cities um, were abandoned, and the civilization went down little by little. Then we go to the Teotihuacan. again. Anybody been to this place? Yeah? So you might know how it is when you enter this archaeological site. You are greeted by the temple of the sun. It's not a pyramid, a temple. And uh, this structure covers an area of 7.5 football fields, uh, it's about 21 story high, and it's calculated they took 250 years to be built. And we know it's a temple. Well, this is how a thing it used to look like in those days. But they still find, found the, uh, the ruins of this little, little temple here on top. So the same situation that it was happening with the, the, uh, the temples of the Maya, on top of this uh, structure. And this was an ancient commercial and religious center, and uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, cities uh, in the world at, at that time. And you can see the Temple of the Sun here. This picture was taken from the Temple of the Moon that you can see over here. This was uh, uh, of the Sun. And right here, along this avenue of the death, we can find more of this uh, structures. It, they look, once again, like a pyramid, but you can see this darker square. Well, there on top, there was, you know, like a little, little, little house, a construction right there who will have a function, uh, either religions, religious or government uh, a function. And then, this avenue of the dead is, is about a, uh, two miles long, and then there was another avenue that would go across, and this will divide the city in four different neighborhoods. And then in each neighborhood, there was a civilization, a culture from a different part of Mexico living there. But why? It happened that their colleagues found out that this Temple of the Sun was built on top of a cave, and the same situation happened in Chichen Itza. And the caves for, for these people used to be sacred because they believed that this was the entrance to the underworld in which other gods used to live. So here they made a divine alignment with the gods from the, from the underground, and then the gods from the sky, and then here in the middle, it was the realm of men. So men will be in between these two uh, divinities here. After we were gone, basically to the same area nearby, the Aztec arrived. And they came from the north of Mexico, south of the US. And because of this god here, Winchiraposhtli, did you pronounce that name? <laughs> okay, good try. And Winchiraposhtli told the Mexica, which is the uh, actual name of the Aztec, and you can see Mexica looks pretty much like Mexico, right? Mexica, so Mexico means the land of the Mexica, also means the belly button of the moon. 
And so this guy told him, go south and uh, you're going to find a new place where to find your home. So after 200 years migrating, uh, well, the Aztec arrived, the Mexica arrived to where nowadays is the uh, uh, Mexico City. But uh, Wizard of Oz told him, okay, you are going to know where to build your home when you find an eagle standing on a big bird cactus devouring a snake. Where have you seen this before? That's right, it's in our flag. But it happened that they found this eagle, and um, it was in a little tiny island in the middle of a lake. And all this story our flag is telling you that. So the Aztec, they had a really big challenge here to build a city in the middle of a lake. But they were very smart, and by the year 1325, they built Tenochtitlan was one of the biggest cities of the world at the time, was connected to the mainland, to these bridges, it had a system of uh, canals that would go all, all around the, the city, and if we zoom in here to the center of the city, is where we find the most important place, it's all the government and religious buildings in here, and there in the middle is we find the Templo Mayor, the main temple, you can still find the ruins of this temple in Mexico City next to the main the main plaza to the Zocalo. And uh, once again, this is a temple, not a pyramid. And uh, here on the left is the house of Tlaloc, the god of the rain, and here uh, the, the house of Huitzilopochtli, the sun god, also he was the god of war. But this god was very thirsty of human blood, so he demanded sacrifices to let the sun come back every day. So the Aztec used to go to all their places, all the regions, capture people for the sacrifices. And they will bring them here to the top of the temple. And then with an obsidian knife, they will cut the chest open, they will take the heart out while it was still beating, and then they will offer it to which your wash slave. Uh, okay, this is not very happy for your vacation, so. <laughs> Move on. Then in the year 1519, there was a prophecy saying that another god, actually it was a good god, Quetzalcoatl, also known by the Mayas, Kukan, or by the Inca as Viracocha, all this god, he said that he will come back that exact day, that exact year. But it happened that in this year, the Spanish arrived to Veracruz. And when the natives saw them, well, these guys resembled pretty much like Quetzalcoatl, who was a tall person with white skin, blue eyes, a beard, white beard, and, um, and of course, the natives didn't look anything like that. So they said, oh, this must be the god Quetzalcoatl coming back. But the spies of the emperor Montezuma, they said, hold on a moment, we've seen these guys and they are not gods. We know that because they have to eat our own food, they get sick, they die, and especially we don't think gods smell the way they do. <laughs> but the Emperor Moctezuma said, let's be careful, and let's make friends with those guys. So he sent a welcome party, he sent a corn, turkey, food for the, for the animals, food for the, for the rest of the, of the soldiers, but this guy in particular made a mistake because he brought gold. So that sparkled the interest of, Mo, uh, of Hernán Cortés, the conquistador. And he wanted to go to the city of the Aztec, Tenochtitlan, and meet Moctezuma, the emperor. And they did so, and the Spanish stayed there in, uh, in Tenochtitlan for several months. And, well, the idea of Cortés was to get Moctezuma, so the Aztec's treasures, but something here was lost in translation because Moctezuma, what he was understanding, well, his treasures for him was, because he was a poet, his treasures for him were uh, his own people, so he would not give him away, uh, give them away. So for that reason, Cortes made Moctezuma his prisoner and started ruling the city on his name. And uh, after a while, well, the Aztec uh, were sick and tired of the situation and went to Moctezuma to complain because they wanted the Spanish out of the sea. But anyway, 
Mark Kasuma couldn't do, couldn't do anything because he was a prisoner. And uh, since he couldn't resolve the situation, the Aztec started throwing stones at uh, their emperor. And here there are two sides of the story. One of those is uh, that um, one of those stones hit Moctezuma in the head and killed him. And the other one was that the, the Spanish, when they saw the situation was out of control, they stabbed him with a sword. But anyway, that was at the end of the most powerful men in the whole American continent. This started a fight right there in the middle of, of the city. But of course, if you're only 10, uh, uh, 700 uh, Spanish, and uh, you're fighting 10,000 really angry Aztec, well, you better run. <laughs> so the Spanish escaped, went back to Veracruz, and but only way for them to realize that nobody liked the Aztec. The other, the other culture they didn't like it because they were stealing their women, they were capturing people for their sacrifices, they were asking for tribute, so Cortes made them his allies. And the next year, they went back to Tenochtitlan. They seized the city for several months. They cut the supplies of food, of water. And uh, because the Spanish lived there in the city for several months, they spread diseases, new diseases from which the natives didn't have any immunity. So two thirds of the population got sick and one third died. So after a while, the Aztec didn't have any other option than going out of the city and fight and much a uh, powerful and bigger army. And uh, unfortunately, well, they were outnumbered, they were weak, they were tired and sick, and uh, they couldn't do much. And that year, 15 and 21, is uh, considered as the saddest, the saddest day in our Mexican history because this powerful and an amazing culture disappeared in just like that. Just let me get a little bit of my here. <laughs> All right, and then from the year 1521, for the next 30 years, is a period known as the Conquest, in which now the Spanish were the strongest player in the game, it was easy for them to conquer the rest <laughs> of, the, of, the, uh, of the people there. So they made them their slaves, they put them to work, they were doing all the hard jobs, and then the Catholic Church arrived, and they imposed a, a new religion with a sword. You don't want to be Catholic, not a problem. You just simply die. <laughs> but anyway, they, they did many things, but at the end, the Spanish would just give all the profit. And then, in the year 1550, basically Mexico was all over the control of the Spanish, and it became part of the Viceroyalty of a New Spain. And that started the colonial period. And at that time, well, this uh, new Spain will go from Canada all the way to Panama, including as well some Caribbean islands. And um, well, at the beginning, because Mexico was a savage country, only men were allowed to go from Spain to Mexico. And uh, well, you know, all men have their needs. And uh, I don't like to use the word raping. So the Spanish were uh, dating some of the natives. And because of this, well, kids were born. And as well, a new race, the Mestizo. And then the Spanish brought African slaves um, into Mexico. They will have kids with them. And, well, that also kids will be born and those as a new race, the Mulato. And then finally, when the Spanish women were allowed to come to Mexico, we'll have kids there, and that's another race, the Criollo. With all these different variations, well, the Catholic Church wanted to make sure that everybody knew their place in society, and that's why they created a racial separation system called castas, in which everybody, depending on the background of their parents, well, they will know from the moment they're born what is your place in society, and they will have no room to go up the social ladder. And for every person that will come to Mexico from Spain, most of the time the beginning were only soldiers, mercenaries. Large uh, pieces of land and a lot of money were given to them to build this so-called hacienda, which means a place in where you do something. 
And uh, nowadays, if you go to some of these places, and they might be like the boutique hotels, wonderful spas, but in those times, there was not the happiest place on earth because a natives and the African slaves were there all day long, no days off, no salary, really hard conditions, working, working really, really hard. And, but on the other side, because uh, the Spanish crown wanted to have their own people educated in order to rule the country properly, well, the first primary school, the second university, and the first printing press of the Americas was built in Mexico City. Then, after, um, as the exploration of the country uh, continued, gold and silver deposits were discovered. So here, something happened, like a gold rush from Spain uh, to Mexico. So everybody wanted to have a little piece, a little piece of, of gold there. So it's in this period in which we got, finally, some uh, culture and educated people from uh, uh, Europe. And now we started to get uh, doctors, uh, architects, writers, and you name it, everybody has started to come here, and with all this richness, a lot of cities were, were built. All these colonial cities that you might have uh, heard about, uh, like Puebla, Querétaro, Oaxaca, San Luis Potosí, Guadalajara, etc. Beautiful uh, places and in which uh, civil monuments, forts, and uh, especially a lot of churches uh, will, were built. So the Spanish brought with them the European Baroque and wanted the Mexicans to replicate it. But of course, Mexicans never saw a church in Europe. So they just started to do things the way they, they thought it was best and they created a new architectonical um, style, the Mexican Baroque, also the Trigueresque. And um, these things, when you go inside, they're just Unbelievable, jaw dropping. Just let me show you this picture here. These are my friends that are getting married here. And this church is in a little town, maybe 5,000 5, people living there. And this church, it might be like a 30, 30 feet by 100. Super tiny, but you can see everything is covered with gold, uh, paintings, and the sculptures from the 16th century. So it's unbelievable. You have many churches like, like that all, all over the place. Then, also in this period, is when the Mexican cuisine was developed. But I'm not talking about tacos or nachos or burrito. That's not even Mexican. <laughs> you know, just to, to well, I, I, I can talk an hour straight just about the Mexican food, but I'm just going to tell you, Mexican food is just simple as that. As the combination of ingredients from all over the world, from Europe, from the Middle East, from Africa, from the Caribbean, from South America, and from Asia, all together in one single place. Then, uh, we also, in the, in the year 1600, uh, the tequila, or national drink, was developed. And I think tomorrow we're gonna have a talk about uh, tequila as well. And then, also the worldwide known mariachi music as well. But not everything was uh, happiness here. Because remember, we were talking about all those harsh conditions and everything. Um, because of that, rebellions and uprisings occurred all over the country. By, but they remained uh, local uh, because the punishment for rebellion was dead. Simple as that. No questions asked. And because of this situation, there was a gentleman, a Catholic priest, Miguel Hidalgo. He was very unhappy with the situation given to the, to the, to the natives. And uh, even though he was a criollo, uh, his parents were from Spain, he was born in Mexico. He was really, really against all this unfair situation. So one day he couldn't take it anymore. And uh, the night of 15th of September of 1810, he called people to his little church. And they arrived there, and um, he urged them to fight for their freedom, to fight for the rights, and finally to fight for their independence from Spain. And where it started as a movement with only 200 people, after one year, there were more than 10,000 following him in the struggle for independence. 
And now we're talking about everybody. Everybody basically who is not Spanish will go for, for the fight. Indians, farmers, slaves, even the aristocracy, everybody will join. And then after 11 years of, of war in the city where I was born, Cordoba, the state of Veracruz, one more time, and uh, Spain gave the independence to Mexico. And this is then, we celebrate our independence on September the 16th. That's our Independence Day. It's not Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> but we're going to get uh, to that point. So this is the night before the 15th. Uh, this is Mexico City, the main, the main square. So tens of thousands of people come here for the fireworks, music, drinks, uh, a food. Well, big, big celebration here, right here. And it doesn't matter how big or small your, your city is, there is going to be something happening. So this is my town, it's very small, but you can see everybody in the town is right here in the center. But this is the palace of the government, and, uh, and uh, right here in the middle, there is a balcony. And uh, right there, well, the, the mayor of the city is gonna come out, it's gonna, gonna come out to the balcony, and then he's gonna remind us about the heroes who gave us independence. Also, there is a bell, and he's gonna ring the bell. And then he's gonna say, Viva Mexico! And then the crowd goes crazy and everybody says, Viva Mexico! <laughs> okay, next time, right? So, let's give it one more try. So the video comes out of the, the balcony. He reminds us of the hero who gets independence. He rings the bell and then he says, Viva Mexico! And everybody says, Viva Mexico! Si, sí, senor. The kibla for everyone. That's the way we do it. You are ready for the party. And then, this is the 15th. And then the next day, there is a party. It, in the same, in every single city there is a parade. Most of the time they are um, uh, the students going on the streets and then do the parade, but especially in Mexico City, we have a military parade in which the army from all over the country concentrates just right there. And it's, it's pretty impressive. And any, but anyway, if, if your government is uh, you know, planning on invading our country again, that's the day to do it. <laughs> And the rest of the country sound protected. They don't tell them. It was me who told you that. <laughs> anyway, the, and this is to commemorate this. The General Agustin de Iturbide entered in Mexico City. He was in charge of the Mexican army against the Spanish. So after that, well, well just let me point out something here. You see, this is his flag. Green, white, and red. With the time, the scholars changed places and became the color that we have now. But anyway, people wanted him well, to, to rule the country because of his success. And then he became the president of Mexico. But as you can see, um, not the president, the empire, the, the emperor of Mexico. But it was a really short empire, only one year. And the reason is just here. You can see dressing up really fancy. For that year, he was just celebrating and because of that reason, he was kicked out of the power for another general, Antonio Lopez de Santana. Well, because of that reason, he became very popular, and then he became a politician, and uh, later, well, he became the president. But in those times, Mexico used to look like this, right, from here up to here. But most of the people used to live here in the southern part of the country. So Santana wanted to activate the economy of this region over here, because there was barely somebody living right there. So he thought it would be a good idea to bring Americans to settle here in Texas. And I don't know if he was giving away free margaritas or something, <laughs> but in just a few months, uh, 12,000 Americans came to settle here in Texas. And that started to create a lot of problems because there were only 3,000 Mexicans. So the Americans were still in the jobs of the Mexican people. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> you got the job. 
Anyway, because of that reason, sometimes I say, okay, okay, stop it, stop it. No more Americans coming into Mexico. He, 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 he uh, bans, you know, Americans uh, coming and settle here in Texas. But Americans like Texas so much, they didn't care. They just kept crossing illegally into Mexico. <laughs> Because of that reason, President Santana ordered to build a wall. <laughs> Wait a second. Uh, I think it didn't happen. But, uh, anyway. Anyway, Texans, Texans, now Texans like Texas so much that they declare their independence from Mexico in 1836. Of course, Mexico didn't, didn't agree with that. But then, in 1845, the United States incorporated Texas into the Union. And that is part of the Mexican-American War. It was only three years, very short. Uh, well, okay, the same, long story short. Um, the uh, uh, American army was more powerful, was bigger, better trained than the Mexican one. And, uh, well, they went to Veracruz. They invaded the country to Veracruz and they marched to Mexico City. Really, really easy, actually. And they are here, remember all the fireworks and people here? Well, now this same place in Mexico City was full of American people, but they're not tourists, they're soldiers. <laughs> and, um, and uh, well, they captured the country, they captured the president, <coughs> they captured Santana, and, well, in order to, to get uh, Santana his freedom, and uh, the, uh, the army, the American army out of Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, Utah, Texas, New Mexico, California, was sold to the US for $15 million. That is a bargain. Yeah. Okay. A few, few years later, this is my favorite guy in Mexican history, Benito Juarez, Zapotec, India, Indian. Uh, he was a shepherd, actually from a mountain in the state of Oaxaca, well, Huatulco, that's the state of Oaxaca. So, he went, he moved to Oaxaca, he started, uh, he studied uh, law, he become, uh, became a lawyer, then a judge, and well, went all the way uh, up to the, uh, to become, until he became the president. So, he was very ahead of his time. He wrote the new constitution, he established Mexico as a federal republic, and also he created the reform laws, which separated, separated the state from the church. And it will take a lot of away, a <coughs> lot of their, their uh, privileges, like a lot of money, a lot of buildings and churches and hospitals, and gave everything to the state. Of course, the conservatives didn't like that situation, and they declared the war to the president. That's known as the reform war. But because uh, we just recently had the Mexican-American War, well, the country was, was broke, was very poor. So he, he didn't have any money for weapons or to sustain uh, his, his army. And for that reason, well, he borrowed money uh, from Spain, England, and France. Okay, long story short, he won the war. And these three countries wanted their money back but the country was, was broke, no money to pay. And because of that reason, uh, these countries sent their armies to Veracruz one more time. But then uh, the president made a deal with Spain and England, and they would pay little, little by little. But France didn't accept that deal. So, so the French army was sent to, to their cruise to invade, to start the, the, the invasion of the, of the country. And that, at that time, they were considered the best of the world. But then, what happened here is, when they were going from Veracruz to Mexico City, right in the middle, there is a city called Puebla, and they arrived there on May the 5th of 1862, Cinco de Mayo, right? And what had happened here was that the army the Mexican army that was waiting for them in a fort, there in that fort, 
there, there is, there was, um, the gown founder was right there in the middle of the fort, and it happened, with, uh, it exploded, and it killed the whole army. So there was nobody to protect or to fight against the, the French. So there was a desperate situation. So basically just um, untrained soldiers and farmers were in charge of fighting uh, the, the army. They were on number four to one and most of their, 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 their weapons were farming tools, machetes and, and sticks and, and things like that. But they were very great. You don't want to mess up with some of these guys. Because even though against, against all, all the odds, the Mexicans defeated the French, and the French didn't have any other option than going back to Veracruz and just wait there. Because they're in Puebla, they lost the battle. That was in Cinco de Mayo. And because of this reason, well, because France not only wanted to take, to take a, uh, Mexico, but because the US was having the Civil War, then it's another opportunity to go and also take the US. But because of these people here, they couldn't do it. And actually, Lincoln sent a thank you letter to Benito Juarez, the president of Mexico, uh, saying, well, thank you for stopping these guys because we already have our own situation right here. If you think about it, if it is not because of these uh, farmers here, well, we will be talking French. Right now. Okay, next year they, the French got reinforcements and they came back to, uh, to Puebla. But this time they won the battle and then they made it all their way to Mexico. In Mexico City, they captured the country. And then Napoleon III sent this guy, the Austrian Archduke Maximilian, to be the Emperor of Mexico. That was also a very short uh, 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 empire, only three years. And the reason is because France started to have, to have a, um, uh, a war with Spain, so the, the army, the French army that was protecting him, needed to be withdrawn back to Europe, so he was left unprotected. So that was a chance for Mexicans to capture Maximilian and uh, execute him. And in order to do that, it was this gentleman here, Porfirio Diaz. He was a hero already because he fought the French in Cinco de Mayo, but then after this, well, he became a rock star. You just look at all this stars from here. So he became the president for 35 years. He really liked the job. And here, this, this guy, uh, you know, our history is treating him really unfair. And they put him as a dictator, well, he kind of was, but he brought a lot of advances. Mexico. Uh, so our economy grew, uh, uh, most of the, uh, the railways that we have nowadays, he built them, uh, telephone, telegraph, uh, industry, mining, and cultural commerce, all that was, was expanded. Many things that when you go, for example, to Mexico City now, and, and you find like the Palace of Fine Arts, uh, and everything, whatever it looks French, well, he brought it. He brought it uh, from, uh, from Europe. And uh, made uh, Mexico City look really, uh, really pretty. And so, architecture, gastronomy, fashion, education, and health system were brought from Europe. And when you look at these people, you might think, oh, this is the high society from Paris. No, this is actually from Mexico City. Um, but, well, fortunately, they only focus on certain regions, and then the rest of the country remained extremely poor. So, uh, the um, all over the country, uh, it was really, really happy about this uh, situation. Very, very uh, wide uh, gap in between the rich and the, and the poor. So then, after 35 years, he wanted to retire and call candidates to become the president. And this guy did that, Francisco Madero. So in 1910, uh, uh, he started going around the country, bringing a message of social equality and rights and things that basically will destroy what Diaz was doing for the last 35 years. And for that reason, well, he was accused of, of prison and he was sent to jail. But, you know, most of the people, the poor, when they finally saw uh, a little light at the end of the tunnel, boom, gone. And that made a lot of people really angry. 
especially these two guys. Pancholilla, a uh, bandit in the north, and Emiliano Zapata, a horse trader in the south. And in uh, November the 20th of 1910, they started what is known as the Mexican Revolution. That was a terrible time for the country because more than uh, one million persons died during uh, the conflict. And in this, in this fight, basically everybody got involved, including women and children as well. Anyway, for the first two years of the uh, revolution, uh, Diaz couldn't take it anymore and escaped to France. And then finally, Madero became the president. But unfortunately here, nobody could agree in which direction uh, in Mexico should go, and uh, he couldn't do much. He was stuck. And because of this reason, another guy, another general, Victoriano Huerta, killed Madero, took the power, and instated a dictatorship. That reunited the revolution one more time, but this time there was a new player into this, into this game. The general, Venus Piano Carranza. At the beginning, he joined Villa and Zapata to take Huerta down. But once, once they killed uh, Huerta, he became enemies with the other two. That was his idea from the very, very beginning. And, uh, well, uh, so this guy, he, he took his, his army to one side, and then uh, Villa and Zapata marched uh, in uh, December uh, 1914 to Mexico City. And there you have 50,000 of the revolutionaries entering there. So they captured the country here. And uh, this is my favorite picture in Mexican history, in which we have Villa sitting in the president's chair and Zapata next to him and all uh, his uh, commanders here on the side and all the people that were with him at this moment. So let us have these two guys sitting right there with all the power in their hands and uh, with a very a powerful army uh, on their backs. And they were looking at each other and they said, we have no idea how to rule a country. <laughs> like most politicians nowadays. <laughs> they said, okay, let's go back to our business. And they took their armies and left Mexico City. They continued the fight for the land and the rights of, of the people. That was a bad move, actually, because that was the chance for uh, Carranza to take his army into Mexico City. He took the power, he became the, the president, and then, now with all the power, he managed to dismantle Villas and Zapata's army. Then he got Zapata killed, and then in 1917, he wrote a new constitution, which is actually the constitution that we still have in nowadays. And then, what had happened for the last uh, 100 years is very boring, so I'm not going to tell you about it. <laughs> so just to finish this presentation, I just I would like to uh, review very quickly how our uh, patriotic holidays, so we understand them a little bit, a little bit better. So first of all, we have September the 16th, the SSA is September. It was the most important patriotic holiday in Mexico because we got our independence from Spain and New Spain became Mexico again. The second one, November the 20th, is because of the revolution and the establishment of the new system. And finally, we have Cinco de Mayo. It was the most important patriotic uh, holiday only in the state of Puebla. That's it. In the rest of the country, we don't really celebrate it because anyway, the French came back, they took the country and stayed uh, uh, an empire, whatever. But uh, they celebrated in Puebla because it was a big, big victory of this of this empire. But having said so, this is this is my question for you now. So if Cinco de Mayo is only celebrated in the state of Puebla, and in the rest of the country, we really don't care. Why is it such a big thing in the US? Sorry? Drinking, yeah, of course. Shit, next is for 
Well, there's so many theories. I cannot agree with any with any of those uh, theories, but but uh, my guess my guess is that maybe because the same for the Mario is easier to say than the as it says as a theory. Gracias.